Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. Today we talk about statistical learning theory, where the emphasis is on theory. So this won't be any Python code or any programming or something, but this will be more mathematical theory of statistical learning, which is, I think, something you should be also aware of that it exists in the area of machine learning. And actually it's, a, it's quite a big branch of machine learning that, that deals with like yeah, more mathematical property of learning me methods and things like the support vector machine directly originates from the research in that area. So it also has some importance. However, it also has some limits. So um, the limits are that in deep learning today, some things are different from what was classical statistical knowledge, like um, having a model with billions of parameters is something if you would have told someone in the 80s that you can train a model with billions of parameters, then they, they wouldn't have believed you that this is possible because of certain statistical properties of estimators and things like that. But it looks like it is possible for certain reasons. And there are some weird effects with stochastic gradient descent, and there are some weird effects with these models that have way too many parameters that are totally overparameterized and quite complicated. Um, there are some effects that are not fully understood yet. So there's a mathematical theory of deep learning is still missing. And that's a very interesting area actually to look into if you are like on, on the mathematics side and like, like that a lot. But today we look at the statistical learning theory, at classical statistical learning theory. And we see kind of what kind of flavor it has. So what kind of results do we get from it? Yeah? And they are quite theoretical. Um, however, it's, it's curious. So there's often something to take away from it. Also, we will look at some proofs as well at the end. And um, if you look at the proofs and try to understand them in detail, they can be also disappointing. Yeah? When you look at them and you understand them, then you say, ah, OK, that is everything. OK, that is a mass that's so, that's such a bad, um, whatever, inequality. So this, the, bound is, the bound is so bad, I mean, just to make the proof possible. But OK, yes, and for infinity, yes, it makes sense, and everything goes to 0. But yeah, OK, OK, OK. So that's also kind of interesting. But of course, there are sharper results. There's deeper mathematics in that area too. But it should just give you like an, an insight into this. So how did I make the slides? I basically took the paper from Ulrike von Luxburg and Bernhard Schulkopf. So Bernhard Schulkopf, he's uh, my former boss in Tübingen. So he's the Max Planck director. And Ulrike von Luxburg, she's by now is the professor for computer science in tubing as well. So they are really super experts in this area. I mean, also super experts in many other areas. But they wrote a very nice tutorial called Statistical Learning Theory Models, Concept, and Results in 2008. And so that is a really nice paper. And all my knowledge that I have, I got from this paper. So if there's something unclear in this lecture, if it's unclear to me, I look into the paper. So if it's something's unclear to you, you should also look at the paper. Um, where is it? Can I show you? Oh yeah, here it is. So that's how it looks. It's just 56 page long paper, so it takes quite a while to read it, but it's like written as an introductory paper. Yeah, so it's really, it has a lot of text and a lot of explanations. And so it um, really nicely gives you some insights of what is statistical learning theory and, and what are the current questions in 2006. So here it said 2011, I'm not sure now which is right. Can we see it from here? It says 2009. Okay, that's yet another number. Great. Okay. But today, from the title, I think you will be a able to, to find it. Um, okay, so let's start. So why can I not switch windows? Okay, let's try this. There are, of course, a couple of books that also cover areas, that this area. So there's a more accessible book called Learning with Kernels from Schulkopf and Smola. And um, they have a chapter on this topic as well in there. Basically, learning with kernels is like, it was at some point maybe the Bible for kernel methods, so for methods like support vector machines, for classification and regression, also for kernel PCA and all these related ideas, kernelizing things. So that's a quite nice book from 2002. But the main source actually for statistical learning theories from Vladimir Vapnik, so that's some Russian mathematician who went to Bell Labs in the US at some point. And so he has a, a very nice book called Statistical Learning Theory, which is even older than 1995. And then the nature of SLT is basically like a shorter version, which is more accessible. 
And the less it's a Springer book, and it's like a Springer mass book, so it's also the simpler version is, is much easier. Yeah. Of the older versions, there are even um, versions that were directly translated from Russian into German, and they uh, were published in the GDR, in the DDR. So th this is already older stuff. But nicely, so this, this theory from Vladimir Vapnik and colleagues, so it found its way also into algorithm, which is quite nice. Yeah? So, and there you sometimes see a nice interplay of mathematics and something concrete. So there's also the saying, nothing is as practical as a good theory. And there's definitely some truth to it. Yeah? So you can, you can fill around and try and try and try. That's one thing. But the other thing is in between to take pencil and paper and to think hard about a problem. And then maybe you find something out that helps you also with the implementation of something. Um, and another classical book, another yellow Springer book, is A Prolistic Theory of Pattern Recognition from Luc de Vroy and Geoffrey and Lugosi. Those are also mathematical, very mathematical book with definition and then theorem and these kind of things. So it's real, real math books. Nonetheless, it's quite interesting. Actually, it's quite curious. Often, students of computer science who did very practical work during their bachelor or master, they, then they get into statistical learning theory for their PhD because they want to do something solid, really, something really mathematical, which is super precise. And the other way around works too. If you were a math student and you got were very theoretical, then suddenly for your PhD, you want to do something really practical with lots of programming where you see things appearing on the screen and something. So now you could ask yourself where you are, whether you want to continue more theoretical, then that might be an interesting topic to look at or to be aware of. And maybe you are the one who then develops a new theory for deep learning, which goes beyond these kind of things. But often before developing something new, it's good to learn the older stuff that is already there. So that gives you a basis to think about the, the things to come. OK, so far so good. Let's get started. So what questions are we asking in statistical learning theory? We want to ask these super big, bold questions. So what can be learned by computers? OK, very general question. What assumptions do we have to make to do learning with computers? And what performance guarantees can we give if we see and data points, for example. So those are the big questions. And of course, during this lecture, we won't answer them. But this is like the, the far away goal. And the theory develops steps towards getting a better understanding for these questions. So as I said, a practical result of SLT is support vector learning. So that is, can be really nicely motivated from statistical learning theory, which is a good thing, which we are not doing today here, but which is coming or can be better understood why support vector learning works so well with SLT. So let's start with um, some basic setup, supervised learning, binary classification. And it won't get more complicated than this from the learning problem. So we will only analyze this problem. We don't go to um, multi-class classification or to something else. So that's the basic learning problem we look at. And the problem is that we are given some data points, x1 to xn, and with some class labels. And our task is now to learn a classifier, yeah, which means to learn a function that maps now from the whole space of x to y, to the set of minus ones and plus ones. And the goal is to make as few errors as possible, whatever that means. So that is not yet a mathematical statement, but we will make this mathematically precise. And actually, we've seen it already in earlier lectures, what it means to make as few as possible errors. So there are a couple of assumptions. Um, typically, we assume there is a fixed joint probability distribution. Even being a frequentist or something, or saying I'm not a Bayesian or something, we believe that some of the data pairs, x and y, they're coming from some probability distribution p. Um, and typically, the training data that we have is assumed to be independently sampled from p. So the underlying assumption is often that this data set is IID, OK? So identically distributed, coming from distribution P, and sampled independently. There might be label noise. So some of the labels might be wrong, OK? Also, the classes might be overlapping. So the locations might not be uniquely determining what the right class is. Furthermore, typically, we don't know this probability distribution P, but we just have this training data set. And ideally, we don't want to make an assumption on this probability distribution. Yeah? So it could be anything. And for mathematicians, no assumptions leads immediately to super weird distributions, right? Something like whatever, being class 1 on the rational numbers and being class minus 1 on the real numbers that are not rational. Yeah? So you could define something like that, of course. 
but um, and it's included in this statement there's no assumption on p yeah so it's included however in my head typically i'm having gaussian samples or something i think something that is kind of nice which kind of intuitively makes sense where no weirdness happening yeah so nothing strange but in principle we don't want to make an assumption on p so why don't we want to do that because yeah that would be not so nice that uh, say we say okay the assumption is that p must be a gaussian distribution yeah then that would really limit the applicability of our theory so if we have a training data set we cannot be sure that it comes from a gaussian distribution and if it does not come from a gaussian distribution our theory is useless yeah so that's why ideally we don't have any assumption on the p so that makes our our theory much more powerful but of course that also leads to situation where we can then define very weird counter examples yeah sometimes by saying okay these very weird distributions they are allowed so th they help us sometimes maybe to generate a weird inconsistency example or something like that so now let's see how can we measure now how good a classifier is and for that we define a loss function and that's basically the same as we did before but let's do it again and let's introduce some more notation so here our loss function is this l so this is not an i this is a little l okay and it takes the location and the true label and then the output of our classifier f so f is our classifier that calculates something and it's just defined like this so if f of x evaluates to the value of y then we say everything is fine yeah we pay nothing and otherwise we pay one so we have one error now this is, might be a weird notation maybe this f of x should be just the f right so and then we would apply the f to the x that is given on the first position but this is just notation yeah how you like it whether you like to pass functions or not um, next we can the, define the so called risk and the risk is very easily said the average loss over all data points where average means this is an expectation over all data points so here we are using the unknown probability distribution p to define it yeah so this is like some number that we cannot calculate because for that one we would need the true probability distribution of x and y but if we would have it and on pieces of papers we have it we just call it p then we can define the overall risk just to be the expectation of the loss that we have here so that's the average loss over all data points and it can be shown that basically so there's there's a situation when is this 1 and when is it 0 and if you plug basically in that f of x is not equal to y then it's the same as calculating the probability that f of x is not equal to y okay so that's another way to write it where we say x and y are distributed according to p yeah so that is basically the risk and it is the probability of error yeah it's the same for the 0 1 loss in this case and now it's very reasonable to say okay f is a better classifier than g if its risk is smaller than the other one yeah just a standard thing this is something you encounter very often in mathematics text when you go through it step by step everything looks trivial but once you flip forward things get could get quite nasty and then even though every definition is super simple yeah the the things that you're now talking about get really complicated so that's why you have to go through these things typically step by step and ideally memorize everything or know where to flip back to get the right definitions but each definition is typically quite simple and then it gets kind of connected to build something more complicated so what is the best classifier so let's say we consider all possible functions where here now there's the restriction all measurable functions whatever that is but that makes it a little bit more precise for me as a computer scientist i just say this are all functions yeah all possible functions that's why i call this set of functions f sub all then i can say now among all of those um, is there some function that kind of solves my problem and actually there is one i explain it in a second so the base classifier is minimizing the overall risk that means for all f so for any function f my base classifier is better than everyone else okay now let's see how is it defined so what is the base classifier it's the one with a star and it says one or minus one depending on this function eta of x and now what is eta of x eta of x is defined to be the probability that y is equal to one given that x is equal to x so 
it is something that we don't have. Yeah? So we don't have the p, but if we had the p, then we could define the eta. So this base classifier, or this so-called base rule, is just a theoretical construct. Yeah? I can write it down, and I could say the best possible classifier is the one that calculates the probability of being in class 1, given that I know the location. And then if this probability is greater or equal than 0.5, in that case, I'm saying it is in class 1, otherwise in minus 1. By the way, something that might be con uh, confusing, we always uh, call these functions classifier. In the statistics literature, these functions are also sometimes called rules. Okay? Why? I don't know why. I can only make something up. So this rule tells us here whether to return a 1 or a minus 1. So it's a, re a rule to decide the class. Okay? And, um, but yeah, we will use both, both words in this lecture. So, so far so good. So can we prove this? Can we, do we have enough material to prove something like that? Yeah? And the answer is yes. The proof is on the next page. Um, OK, let me show you this one. Or actually, you like to see this stuff on the board, right? So maybe that's, that's better to see on the board. Yeah, I will try it, OK? So I will try it. And so let me first give you an overview of the proof. So first, I, I derive an expression yeah, for that, an ex that an example is wrong, okay, given that I know the location. I'm calculating an ex expression like that, and it's this larger expression here where the function eta already appears. Okay, and once I have that, then I compare basically the probability of error for some other classifier f and for my base classifier f star. I plug in these expressions, and then I need to discuss that the final expression is greater or equal to, one, uh, to zero. And if I can show that, then I've shown that the error for some other rule or classifier is always greater than equal to the one from the base classifier. OK? So let's try to do that. So this is the last time for me to memorize something from the proof. OK, let's start with the top one over there. So um, <coughs> first I need to derive a good expression for y being not equal to f of x. I think given that y is equal to 1 and x is equal to x. Is that right? I need to check that one. Otherwise, I mess up immediately. Ah, no, it's not. OK, so it's not right yet. So it's just this expression. OK, so far so good. Um, so let's rewrite this. Let's introduce this random variable y. And we can have a case distinction. Um, either y is equal to 1 or y is equal to 0, OK? So basically, I think I can say something like, so f of x is equal to 1. And I put Iverson bracket to get the first sum and plus equal to minus 1. And I have the second expression. So if it is equal to 1, I multiply this now with y being equal to 1, given that x is equal to x. OK, so that is basically the situation where y is equal to 1. That's one possibility. And I'm only interested in the situation that f of x is also equal to 1. And I think I need to look into my slides to really do it right. Let me peek into it. But for the explanation, then I, I can go to the board. Ah, OK, I did already a couple of steps at the same time. Fine. OK, interesting. So um, yes, and it's also already slightly wrong, right? So where do I want to get? OK, so first of all, this must be not equal then to these values, right? Then I'm doing a mistake, because the y should be different to the f of x. So I can write it like this. Um, and then there's this thing that um, I think that one can be written as 1 minus f of x being equal to 1, right? So if this statement is wrong, yeah, then this gives me a, a 0. So I get 1 minus 0, which is the one that I would get here. If this statement is true, I get a 1, and I have 1 minus 1, 0. Okay, So I can replace it like that. Now, this one over here, that's already my eta of little x. 
Yeah, just by definition, it was defined like that. And then I'm doing, I think, the same thing over here. And now in order to get an eta of x, I can replace it with 1 minus eta of x. OK, so far so good. I think this looks right. OK, I think that's the expression that I need. And now I need to compare basically the risk of any classifier f. So f is some classifier from this f all. Yeah, and I compare it with the risk of f star. And now what I want to show is that this, this difference here is greater or equal to 0. If I can show that, then that one is always smaller than that one. OK? So now let's apply uh, the formulas that we had up here. So this is the probability of error. So this expression is the one up there with f. And the one with f star is the same expression up here where I'm having an f star over there. OK, so now I can just plug in these expressions, this big gigantic expression here. So here are some brackets missing. So it would be 1 minus Iverson bracket plus 1 minus So, and now the same thing minus the same stuff where I'm having the f star. And notice that here I'm just having the eta of x, so the, here's no f anymore. Okay, so the f only appears in the Iverson brackets. And if I'm doing something terribly stupid here, you should tell me, because I think you can see the slides. OK, and next what I'm doing, I'm just sorting terms. Yeah, let's collect. I think I need to collect the eta x. Let me peek into my slides. Oh, OK, fine, sure. So first of all, um, this one here um, can be rewritten, right? I can get rid of the 1 minus by changing the sign in front of that one. Uh, why, why we have that one here? Yes. Oh, it was the y being equal to minus 1. And that is basically the same as 1 minus probability of y being equal to 1 given x. And that was the eta of x. So I replace this expression with 1 minus eta of x. Uh, on the left side, uh, the this one? What's that? OK, so that one is that one and that one. And this one is coming over here. OK? OK, so this even looks better now. Um, so maybe I should first simplify it further. So, um, OK, what do I get? I get an eta of x from this one. And I have an eta. Well, let's try to drag out this, this guy over here. Ah, OK, let, let me just try. So eta of x, it's this one here, minus. This one times eta of x. And here's another one, f of x, with a minus eta of x. I need to peek in my slides. So am I right with the top one? Yes, I think I'm fine with the top one. Blah, blah, blah. Ah, OK. But why?
Let me just let me just check where I need to get to. Okay, that one minus that one. Ah, okay. Okay, I give it a try on the board. So I think this is okay. However, I will have this term times eta x and the next term times eta x. Let's combine those two. So then I will have 1 minus this expression minus 1 plus this expression. So then let's start with the 1 with the f star. Is that 1? Minus. OK, this is combining those two expressions. Let's do something similar over here. So we have the same factor over there. So it will be just um, the distance between, um, or it will be the other way around. So let's um, take the minus sign from here. So it will be. That one is this minus sign times this, and the minus sign over that gives me a plus. This minus sign of that expression gives me this one. So times eta of x, right? So far, so good. And now I'm missing these two ones. So I'm having another term, let's say minus the distance between f star of x yeah so far so good so the first two terms are combined into one then this Iverson brackets together with the minus eta x get combined into one and because of the minus sign they are swapped and then I have the 1 and the 1. And I want to have the star at the beginning. That's why I put the minus sign here in front. OK? And now what do we get if we look from far away? So we see that this expression appears twice. Yeah, so I can get rid of it and can put a 2 um, in front of it. So this is like 2 times eta x. And then this term is gone. And then I'm having minus 1 this term. So I'm having a minus 1 like this. OK, so far, so good. OK, great. So that is our expression for the error. And what we want to show is now that this one is greater or equal to 0. And for that, we do a case distinction. OK, the first case. It's that eta of x is greater or equal than 0.5. Okay, that's one possibility. If that is the case, then 2 times 0.5 is at least 1. Minus 1 is a positive number. Furthermore, eta of x is greater or equal to 0 0.5. That means that the first one here is giving us a 1. Right? And then the other one can do whatever it wants. So it's greater or equal to 0, the first term. So check for the first case. Let's look at the second case. So if it's smaller than 0 0.5, this term is negative, right? because this will be something less than 1. And the first term here will be 0. So this whole term will be 0 or negative because of the second one. OK, so negative, negative is also fine. OK, so that is the proof. OK, what is the difficulty here? Uh, the filling around and bringing it to some good form such that you can do, do some good reasoning, right? I mean, we could have 
made such case distinction already up here maybe, but it would have been more complicated to see really what to do. Okay, so far so good. So what have we proven now? So we've proven now that the base classifier minimizes the risk. Okay, so there is some optimal solution. This R of F star also gets a name, it's called the base risk or the base error. Okay, and that is just a number that is like depending on the probability distribution P, yeah, the base risk will be the smallest achievable risk. Yeah? So it doesn't depend on a data set or anything. It doesn't even depend on the class of functions you are looking at. So the base error considers all possible measurable functions. Yeah? But um, it, it then, then just outputs some number. Okay, so far so good. So that is the same proof with all the details for you. So um, we can also reformulate the binary classification problem now as follows. So we could say design an algorithm yeah, that creates blah, 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 a classifier, a function f sub n, such that the risk r of fn is as close as possible to the base risk. Okay? Since, so we assume that the data, the training data, is coming from some distribution p, so the base risk is defined. So there is a smallest error, and it can be mathematically formulated. And then our goal now is to say um, the, the risk of some function f sub n, where the n now says after seeing n data points. Yeah? So that should be as close as possible to the base risk. OK, so far, so good. Um, this lets us define consistency of classification algorithms. So let me first show you Again, the definition. So consistency means that basically the probability that the risk of my function that my algorithm spits out gets as close as possible to the best possible one. So that was before the F star, but now we have the F sub capital F. So let's look what that one is. So the F sub F is like the best risk that we get for some restricted function class. So if we have F sub all, yeah, then the F, F sub all is f star, that's the base classifier. However, sometimes we want to restrict the class of functions, for example, only look at linear functions, or only look at polynomials, or only look at neural networks, or only look at whatever you like, okay? And that will be also the basic idea of statistical learning theory, that it's important to look at restricted function classes and not at, at all at, at the same time, at all functions. But that we will see later, okay? So now, consistency means that on the long run, where long run means seeing infinite amount of data, yeah, our algorithm will find the best possible function, or at least a function that achieves the best possible risk. Yeah? So this definition here, this consistency, says it's consistent with respect to a certain class of functions, f, and a certain given distribution, p. However, we could also say universally consistent and now the universally is basically a universal quantification over all possible probability distributions. Okay, so the starting point is consistency with respect to f and p. And one more general way to think about it is to say universally consistent, where now the p is kind of with the for all quantification. Similarly, we could also replace, so we could keep the consistency with respect to a certain distribution, but now we call it base consistency if we consider all possible functions. And of course, then there's a combination of both universally based consistency, yeah, where we say we want to consider all possible functions, and we want to be as good as the base uh, classifier, the base rule. Okay? So those are four definitions. However, once you understand the structure of these ones, yeah, then you see that So this is like the initial one, that to make it very definite and precise, and then you generalize in terms of the function, or specialized in terms of the function and in terms of the distribution. OK, so far so good. So we introduce this notation now. F sub f is like the best classifier in a certain class of function. Um, and we have f sub n, that is typically an element of our class f that we are considering. That is the classifier that we get after seeing n data points. Okay? And notice also, so we distinguish here, we call that we have some algorithm, and the algorithm outputs a classifier. Okay, so the algorithm is some learning procedure or some training procedure or something like that. 
Okay, um, there are some interesting questions here. First of all, so if we have the probability of something, right, there should be some random variable in here. And the question is, where is the random variable in here? So that's the first thing to understand. Any ideas? So where is the random variable hidden? So epsilon is, is a constant. OK. Let's go through it. f is fixed, right? So f is like bounded in my definition. It's one particular class of functions. So the f sub f is also defined. It's some function f, right? And for that one, I can calculate a risk. The risk, of course, is the integral over all data points, and I integrate against p. But there's nothing random inside anymore. So I'm just integrating out the random stuff, right? So it's an expectation. So if you take an expectation of a random variable, then you get a real number. So this is also a real number. So it must be somewhere in here. Any ideas where it's hidden? Yeah? Yeah, that's partially right. So it is in the f, and the f can vary, right? So it could be one or the other answer. But still, where are the random variables? The random variables are in my data set. So I have a training data set. OK, in my training data set, I often like to write it as x1, blah, blah, to xn, and y1, blah, blah, to yn. And that is not by chance that I use capital letters, but those are random variables. And so let's make it more concrete. So let's say we have 17, OK, 17 data points. That means I have 34 random variables here. And now if I make my experience, uh, experiments, my measurements today, I get 17 data points, and I have 34 numbers, random numbers. If I do it tomorrow or in another continent or whatever, I get a different random sample. And they are randomly sampled from my distribution p. So the random variables here are my, is my data set. So the data set is a random variable. That's very much like if you have a statistic in mathematical statistic, you are calculating a statistic of something, a p, no, not a p-value, but maybe you're doing some t-test or some other thing, then you are calculating a statistic of a sample, and the sample is some finitely many random variables, and over that, you can calculate the expectation to get your table for some lookup or something. It's quite similar here. So the random bit in this expression is basically the data set that my algorithm sees to generate the fn. And then the fn can be different depending on what data set did I see. So this is why I can really talk about probabilities here. Okay? So it basically means, suppose you fix some algorithm, then Given that you get a random data set, what is the probability that your risk will be only wrong by epsilon or larger than epsilon wrong? Okay? And this probability should go to zero. Yeah, so the probability should be really low that this happens. Yeah, there might be super unlucky data sets, but in principle, the probability of getting a super unlucky data set should go to zero with the larger your data set being. Okay? Okay, so I think I spelled it out here. So it's a random variable because the training set is a random variable in a way. It's a random sample, okay? And since fn is random, r of fn is random, and that makes sense now to talk about probabilities here. Now comes the question. So the super-duper universally based, con based consistent classifiers, are there at all universally based consistent classifiers? Right? There's this thing in mathematics, often you define something, and then comes the existence result. Oh, there exists, every vector space has a basis, for example. And that's not so trivial. I think you need Zorn's lemma or Auswahl axiom or something for that one. So it's not so trivial to show. And then the other one is uniqueness. So often you show existence and uniqueness in mathematics. Here we can only show existence now that there is a universally based consistent classifier. And I don't really prove it, I just state the theorem. And so the theorem is from Stone from 1977. And it says the k-nearest neighbor classifier is universally base consistent. So the k-nearest neighbor classifier, like it's a simple classifier that you can use 
just for playing around. But typically, it doesn't have super good performance. But it's one for which you can prove that basically, um, for any probability distribution, the risk of this, classif of this classifier f sub n will converge against the base risk. So it will achieve the best possible thing. However, for that one, n must go to infinity. So you must see infinitely many data points. And k, the number of neighbors to consider, must also go to infinity. However, in such a way that the quotient k divided by n goes to 0. So there are some technicalities here to really make it precise. Yeah? And I think in the book from uh, Luc Devrois, this yellow one, I think a statistical theory of learning or something, they, 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 they really spell it out and they prove it if you really want to see the proof. Of course, you can also just download the paper from Stone and look at the original one if you really want to see. So how on earth could you prove something like that? That's amazing. And it is amazing, and I think it was amazing at that point of time that you can find one. So I haven't told you what the k-nearest neighbor classifier is. It's written up here, right? So we have the set of k-nearest neighbors, and we do a majority voting among them. So that's it, OK? You can also use the k-nearest neighbor setup for regression. Yeah, then you just average the values of your k-nearest neighbors. And it's in a way, it's like a theoretical method but often it's very practical and very easy to use. So if you have some concrete data where it's easy to calculate distances between data points, the k-nearest neighbor classifier is a very good baseline, right? It's very nice to try. And if you come up with a better classifier, you, it's better if you, at least you should beat the k and n classifier, right? Otherwise, it's not really worth it what you're doing. OK, so there are universally based consistent classifiers. I won't show you the proof here. That's too difficult for me. But yeah, I, I think intuitively it makes sense. If you have some very complicated classification function, by seeing more and more and more and more data, you're more densely filling up the whole space. And then if the number of neighbors also goes to infinity, that kind of allows to kind of average the right thing. So I'm not sure whether there's further additional assumption, but as I know, I think it says for any probability distribution. So also for weird ones, yeah. However, with the one with the rational numbers and the non-rational, I'm not sure. That's, again, some, some strange one. But maybe there's, maybe there's the exception that it's not measurable or something. I have no idea. OK. OK, so there are some subtleties, and some people like to think about it. OK, so far so good. We talked about training data all the time, but we, we only talked about the true risk, where the true risk is now the integral over all possible things where we integrate against the probability distribution. However. Typically, we can only look at the empirical risk, where the empirical risk is basically the finite summation of our training data. So now, how can we define it precisely? So given some training data, um, we cannot really calculate the risk, but we can only calculate the empirical risk, which is now very much the same as we did in sampling, right? In sampling, we had integrals, and we replaced it with a finite summation. That's the same idea, in a way. Yeah? We also replace this integral by a finite summation. So finite is always good, because computers must terminate in finite amount of times. So that's why such a for loop from 1 to n is something that can be calculated, really. And here we just iterate over the data set, and we check whether we did a good job or not. And this is the so-called empirical risk. Yeah? And on any training data set, no matter how large it is, we can calculate it. Of course, now the elephant in the room is, so the empirical risk does it, if I make that one small, so ba basically doing gradient descent on that one, does that always imply now a small overall risk, right? So that would be something super useful. Because if that's the case, yeah, in that case, I can have a gradient descent algorithm on the empirical risk, and everything is fine. And that's basically the, the, the main question for the rest of the lecture. So how can we bound the distance between those two? Are there some mathematical expressions yeah, that ideally go to zero for n against infinity. Yeah, if that's the case, if we have a method where for n against infinity, like the empirical risk gets as close as possible to the true risk, then everything is great. Yeah, and as a quick preview, yes, we can show something like that. Um, however, we need to restrict the class of functions. Okay, so we cannot take f all, but we have to take like only the linear functions or only the polynomial function or only the some neural network or something. So we need to restrict the set of functions. Um, 
This can be also now defined to that, that such a classifier will generalize, and generalization is defined as follows. So if this difference yeah, of the true risk and the empirical risk, if that one is small, then we say that a given classifier generalizes well. So in a way, this classifier has only seen 100 data points, but if the empirical risk of that one gives us already a very good hint on the true risk, then the F sub n generalizes very well on all data. Yeah? It doesn't mean that it's necessarily a good, it has a good performance, so it could also be that my classifier is super bad, but it generalizes well if my empirical estimate is already a good, um, is already quite close to the true risk. Okay. So generalization only means that my empirical error is a good estimator for the true error. So that may be a more mathematical statement here. So far, so good. So let's look at some examples. This is also all from the paper. So there are some data points, which are these, these, these nodes here, these, these, um, these circles. And now they, uh, there are two functions. One is the dashed function, which is this wiggly one. And then there's a solid one, which looks like a um, linear function. First observation, the empirical risk for both are very small. right? For the dashed one, the empirical risk looks like it's 0. We are exactly on the line. And for the linear one, we are having a small error. Yeah? So it's a very small risk. Now, suppose the true risk is the dashed one. Okay? It could be that this one is the true function. Okay? In that case, the, solid, the risk of the solid one is, is quite large. So we don't have good generalization in that situation. Yeah? So this is the true risk of the solid one, because the dashed one is true. So basically, for these points here, I'm making a really large mistake. And for these points over here, I'm also making a really large mistake. So we see that the RF solid, if, it's, uh, it, no, if the dashed one is true, then the empirical um, risk of the F dash is not a very good estimator of the one for the true one. Okay. And that also holds the other way around. If the solid one is true, yeah, it also means that the, if the other one is my estimate, it might be a very, very bad generalization here. Okay? So it can be wrong in both sides. Um, of course, now the question is, which do we find better? So we could say the dash one is great, because it uh, has a very, very small training error. However, possibly, if the true one is something simpler, then it's, it's called overfitting. So overfitting meaning the empirical risk is really going almost to zero. However, the true risk is quite large because there's something, something wrong. If we prefer the solid one, so that is like a simpler function, but with a larger training error. And this is sometimes called underfitting. So maybe that's not, it's not complex enough to really explain everything. And so you see that there's a trade-off between the function class that you take and the training, training error that you get. Yeah, so in principle, you can make the training error really, really small, but possibly then it's a very bad estimate for the true risk, or you make the, um, your model class super simple, yeah, and then you might encounter a larger training error, but maybe that's a better estimator of the true risk. So there's some trade-off. And this is also called the bias-variance dilemma, and it's like a classical problem in statistics. And other words for bias is approximation error, and for variance, it's estimation error. So here's another picture of the same situation. So suppose this f base is the true function, OK? Then there are two types of errors to my current fn. There's one. So maybe I have some estimation error. Since I'm only seeing finitely many data points, I'm not finding the best function among my function class f. Yeah, so the best one would be f sub f. But I'm only finding one which is like yeah, reasonably close to f sub f. And so that is the so-called estimation error. Okay? And the other part of the error is that the best that I can might be still a little bit off from the base error. Because I'm only considering linear function, but the true function may be something more wiggly. Okay? And now, if you look at these terms, basically the inner term here appears twice with a minus sign. So it can be removed. And it shows us that the risk, the, the risk of the function that I calculate from my algorithm compared with the base error can be decomposed into these two parts here. So into an estimation error, also called variance, and into an approximation error, also called bias. So it's an approximation error because my function class is just not capable of getting closer. 
So it's an approximation problem that I have here. Yeah? It's also called a bias because it's kind of biasing my solution towards linear function. So I have some bias in my model that kind of restricts the possible performance. That's why it's also called a bias. On the other hand, the other one here, if my function is um, quite flexible, then my estimation error can get quite large. If you have a, a, a linear function that you want to estimate, you only need a couple of numbers to find the slope and to, to find the offset. But if you have a very wiggly function, you need many more data points. So if you have a larger function class, then typically the estimation error gets larger. So <coughs> you could see it like the inner bubble is getting larger. Then you have a larger estimation error. Um, and so again, suppose I choose a solid line as my model. Yeah? So model everything with a straight line with a linear function. That would mean I having a large bias. So I'm restricting myself very much. So I have a... Um, I have a very large approximation error, so the distance from the 2, 1 to my function class can be then very large. But I have a small estimation error since my bubble is kind of small and it's easy to estimate the best one inside this class. If I choose a dashed line as my model, like a deep learning, super sophisticated billion parameter neural network, I have a very small bias. It's super flexible, so the distance from my function class to the base function to the base classifier is very small. However, I might have a very large estimation error. And again, in deep learning, it's surprising. Yeah, you take super large, complicated model, but your large estimation error doesn't appear to be such a big deal. Yeah? So that's kind of unclear. And it's kind of, so there are some effects that go beyond what has been known in classical statistics so far. So there are some room for improvement. Um, I, I'm not a statistician, so I can only like, um, have some party, party uh, conversation on this kind of topics. But so my, my impression is neural networks are super complicated because they are like stacked linear regressions with nonlinearities in between. And maybe a transformer is even more complicated because you multiply things. Those objects are very difficult to analyze. So since you get a nonlinear function and to prove something for nonlinear functions, it's very difficult. The other thing is, an algorithm that minimizes some loss function with some no very nonlinear function might have some very complicated dynamics. Yeah? If you're a physicist, you might know about dynamical systems. And if dynamical systems are nonlinear, anything can happen. Things can explode and things can go down to zero. So it's very complicated to really understand and to analyze. However, that is where you come into play. So you program some deep learning neural network, you make it work. And everyone is surprised that you can get it to run. And then should come the theoreticians and show you why does it work. So that's like an interesting situation we are in right now. We have these very complicated models. They work, but we don't fully understand the mathematics behind it, why it works so well. Anyway, nonetheless, the bias variance and the estimation approximation trade-off is still valid. And it's still something that is taught in classes. And so it's still like the right way to think about certain situations. OK, um, now how do I decide this trade-off? Basically, the trade-off is decided by choosing a particular function space. Right? So if I say I'm looking only at linear functions, then I'm saying, OK, I'm putting a strong bias, and I'm expecting a small variance. And if I choose my function space super wiggly, super um, general, in that case, it means, OK, I, I, have a large, I have a small bias, but I'm accepting a large estimation error. Okay? So far, so good. Um, next, we are going to derive a generalization bound. And as a sneak preview, so what is a generalization bound? So it's something like this. Somehow we want to bound the error, the probability of error between the true risk and our empirical risk. Yeah? So in principle, we want this to be small. So we want to say, what is the probability that this thing is greater than some epsilon? Okay. And we want this probability to get smaller and smaller and smaller the more data we see. So this probability is less than or equal to some other weird expression over here. And ideally, this expression on the right-hand side goes to 0 for n against infinity. If it goes to 0, then the probability that we make some mistake with our empirical risk compared to the true risk yeah, is the probability of seeing that is getting really, really small. And of course, 
it depends on how large of a gap we allow. Yeah, that's why here there's an epsilon, and the epsilon also appears on the right-hand side. But let's look where the n is. So the n is appearing over here, which is e to the minus n, which is a good sign because e to the minus n is a function that goes very fast to zero. Okay, that's something good. But then there's something, some other expression over here where the n appears as well with some curly n, where the curly n is not a Gaussian distribution, but it's a so-called shattering exponent or shattering coefficient. So that's something else that we are going to define. And that is a function that grows very fast with the n. And so basically it's a race between the first term here and the second term. And so if we find a function class f where the first term here is growing slower than e to the minus n is going toward zero, then everything is great. Okay? And for example, for linear functions, one can show them that this n of fn is growing smaller, uh, slower than e to the minus n is going toward zero. Okay, so that is the overall idea. One little detail I skimmed over, I, here's the supremum. So basically, even we want to have it even in the worst case scenario. So for any of the function, for any of the function, we want to have this property. Okay, so we want to have it really super powerful, this bound. Okay, these bounds can be also rewritten, um, and I'm now not showing it to you. I just say it in word how to derive this one. If I have time, at the end of the lecture, I can show you how to transform this expression into that expression. The story is, so for, for the expression with the probability, we typically give an epsilon, and then we say, okay, for this epsilon, I have a certain bound on the probability. For the other expression here, I'm giving a probability. So I'm saying if the expression on the right is equal to delta, yeah, so if I have this fixed probability, for a fixed probability, um, now how large is epsilon? So how large is the gap between the true risk and the empirical one? And that can be then rewritten that the true risk is less than or equal to the empirical risk plus some constant, okay? And basically by setting this equal to epsilon, uh, to delta, and then moving two times n to the other side and taking logarithms and so on and so forth, we are getting exactly this expression down here. So that is the expression that we get by setting the top part equal to delta and then solving for epsilon. And then we take the solved epsilon one and we plug it basically into this inequality. So this is basically then the epsilon, the square root of something, okay? And again, here you can also see that for n against infinity, we have square root of four divided by n. So this thing gets really, really small for n against infinity, yeah? Which means that the distance between those also gets really small. Or with other, uh, with other words, if I minimize the empirical risk, I'm always also minimizing the true risk, risk which is a good thing to do, okay? Okay, so far so good. So it has a more general form where I'm always puzzled about the, the second plus because it's under a square root, but let's keep it like that. So in general, one can kind of say that the true risk is bounded by the empirical risk plus some number that comes from the capacity of my function class. Yeah? So the more capa capable my function class is, um, I think the larger this number gets, okay, and the less good my empirical estimate is in terms of the true risk. And then there's some confidence level delta, which is basically this probability that I kind of want to use for the bound, okay? Anyway, so that is something that we would like to derive, yeah? And the other one is just a corolla, corolla, co corollary, I don't know what, corolla in, in German, corollary or whatever in, in English. So it's just following from such a bound. Okay, so we can take from this, if we have a large capacity, that leads to lots of potential overfitting, yeah? So for neural networks, it means, so if, oh, I don't draw a picture now, if you have super many parameters, in principle, you are at the risk of overfitting. However, there's some curious effect that there is some overfitting for neural networks in deep learning, yeah? So first it goes down the performance and then the it gets worse, the error gets larger again if you increase the capacity of a neural network. But then something weird happens and the capacity goes down again. Uh, the, the performance goes, the error goes down again. So this is the error. And this is the capacity. 
So increasing the capacity of a neural network from having a linear function, very simple, large error, you have a very small error at some point, and then if you increase the capacity even further, then suddenly the error goes up again because you only see finitely many data points. But then in deep learning, curiously, it goes down again. And so this going down again, that's something new. And it's called, if you want to Google it, it's called double descent. So um, check this one out if you want to learn about the weirdness of deep learning. Yeah? There are some people who are trying to come up with theories, and they find this effect in many, many models. It even appears in usual linear regression. You can get such an effect. It's quite interesting. OK, so far, so good. Um, so let's go on to the empirical risk minimization induction principle. So that's now basically what we have did intuitively already, of course. We can calculate the empirical risk for a finite data set, right? And my algorithm is basically just finding the, the best function that is minimizing my empirical risk as good as possible. And that could, for example, be done by uh, gradient descent or gradient descent on the, on the zero, one loss. Or if we would have a different loss function, yeah, maybe minimum mean squared error or something like that. That's the usual thing that we're doing. But it gets the name. This is the ERM, induction principle. So given some finite data set, restrict the function class, have a loss function, and then our classifier is defined to be the minimum yeah, of our empirical risk. Of course, the problem, as we've seen, is our empirical risk might be very small, but R of S is large. So of course, we are interested in what's happening for if we see more and more data. And here now, we can use some big hammers from statistics. There's the law of large numbers. So which says something like this, if my random variables, if some random variables psi i are sampled iid, then under certain mild conditions, the empirical average converges against the true average, OK? And that is exactly what we need for, the, for our expressions here. So we have some empirical error. Yeah? And then the law of large numbers will tell us this thing goes against the true risk. So far, so good. How good is this approximation? So how fast? does it go down, right? It only tells us we're doing the right thing, right? But we don't know whether it's fast enough, whether it's going like super fast exponentially or something down with n. And that's something that we look next to. So there are some bounds. And this bound now, just by looking from far away, looks a little bit already like the one that we want to have. So we have like the distance between the empirical error or the empirical risk minus the actual risk that the probability that this one is greater or equal to epsilon is less than e to the minus n, okay? which is something nice. So that is the so-called chernoff hefting bound. It's also old stuff already. And it can be applied to the ERM. So if we apply it, we get some nice bound. Okay? So we see that for lots of training data, the empirical risk is close to the true risk with large probability. However, here's some problem. Yeah? Looks great, but we are not done. The problem here is that this bound requires that the f is fixed. So if I have a fixed function, and then I let n go to infinity, then the statement holds. But typically, we have an f sub n, right? So if we see more data, we will change it. So that's the whole point of training on data, that if we see more data, we are constantly changing and changing and changing everything. So the problem is, so this bound cannot be used right away like this, OK? So that just doesn't work. Um, in particular, even one can show that the, the ERM principle can be even inconsistent. So this looks like some consistency result. However, it's assuming that the f is fixed. But yet here comes a simple algorithm where we show that by minimizing the empirical risk, we can get some wrong result. Yeah? And here's the example. So suppose we are uh, having a location uniformly on the interval from 0 to 1, and the top half is one class, and the bottom half is the other class. Okay? So that is our distribution p. Now here's a class of functions that, that, that I could take. So my training data defines the function as follows. If my x is hitting one of the training points, I just take the true, the true value, okay? just memorizing the true value. If I'm not hitting one of my training examples, then I'm just saying one. OK? So for finitely many data points, of course, the empirical risk is 0. 
right? Because on the training data, I'm doing exactly everything right. However, the true risk is 0.5. So why is it 0.5? Because um, for the true risk, I'm calculating So that is the uniform distribution from 0 to 0.5 to 1. And over here, I was whatever, I don't know, class minus 1. And here, I'm class 1. And now I'm having finitely many data points. So my training error will be exactly right for those. However, um, when I integrate over all and calculate the loss of my x, y, in my f sub n of x, then in most cases, I will do something wrong. I will say everywhere where I haven't seen a data point, I say class 1. So on half of this thing, yeah, up to some finitely many examples, I'm saying the wrong answer. I'm giving the wrong answer. That's why this integral will be equal to 0.5. So I'm only correct on this side, and I'm wrong on the left side, but for some set of measure 0. Yeah? It's a finite set. So what's going wrong here? So my true risk is 0.5, but it's different from my empirical risk for every n, OK? And so what is going wrong? Again, so if I take a fixed f sub n, for example, f, f17 or f100, yeah, then for that one, it is true that I will converge against the true risk. yeah. But my algorithm will change this function, keep changing this function as I go along. And so I never basically reach um, reach the base risk in this case. So I never will really reach the, the base classifier, OK? So that is an example where just minimizing a function where my function is allowed to look like that one, which is like a very special one. Yeah, I can get to something wrong, and I'm having an inconsistent method that for n against infinity is not going against the best possible risk, OK? So instead, what we need to do is we need to restrict the class of functions. Yeah? So it's, it's um, important that we say that we restrict our class of function f sub n. So and then we say that, ah, what? Ah. I'm confused. Ah, OK. So this is defining a class of functions up here that I did. And it was the one that is memorizing finitely many data points, but it's wrong on the infinitely many other examples, OK? So I did the ERM induction principle. So I defined a function class. And I derived my function also following the ERM principle. <coughs> <coughs> However, unfortunately, I got an inconsistent situation here. And so the above class of functions does not lead to universal base consistency. So it doesn't, it doesn't work. So it basically, ERM with all functions um, won't work, and it won't lead to universal base consistency, as this example shows, because that's an example where we are inconsistent. So what we now need to do, we need to have some assumption on the class of functions. Yeah? So we need to restrict those. And um, furthermore, we say a function class fulfills some other uniform conversion, uh, convergence criterion if the following holds, blah, 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 OK? And now if we can prove for our class of functions this blah, 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 then we can show on the next slide that uniform convergence over some function class implies exactly what we want. OK? So there's some other property, this uniform conversion for some particular class of function, if we can prove that one, then we have everything that we want. OK? Then we can prove universal consistency for the ERM. So let, what is this now? Let's go step by step. So this, here's this nice criterion. So this nice criterion says that the true risk minus the empirical one, so this probability should go to 0 for n against infinity. OK? So now how is it different from what we wanted to have? Actually, what did we want to achieve on the convergence slide, uh, onto the consistency slide? It was that my algorithm spits out functions that get closer and closer to the best possible function. Okay? So it's about twice the true risk and not the empirical risk. Okay? So this is what I want to achieve. I want to have an algorithm which is universally consistent with respect to some class of functions. And now 
we have some other criterion which we define for a class of function, and then we can show if we achieve Z1, then we achieve the universal consistency. Okay, so let's go into these into the details. This is also called the uniform law of large numbers. And why is it called uniform? Because we take the supremum over all possible functions. So it's kind of uniformly fulfilling this, that it goes to zero. Okay, that's typically the wording when people use the word uniform. Also, there's uniform conversions, I think, in analysis one or two, where you say that over a whole class of functions, like the thing should converge nicely to the right thing. But it should work for all functions simultaneously and not only for one. Okay? Um, so far, so good. Again, here's a quiz question. I think now you know the answer already. We are talking about the probability, so where's the randomness in here? Yeah? And where's the randomness in this expression? Where are the random variables? Yes? Exactly. So it's in this empirical risk because it's a summation over x1 to xn and x1 to xn where our random numbers and y1 to yn. Exactly. Thank you. So that's good. So furthermore, who depends on n, right? And there's the other answer is already the empirical risk depends on n, right? So that's the only location. These kind of questions are always important to ask yeah, when you see such an expression to understand. So what is this n? So where is the n anyway, right? We can't see it. So where is it? And then you need to drill deeper a little bit. Now comes, so how does the uniform convergence tell us something about universal consistency yeah, in terms, in the context of ERM? I said it already that the uniform con convergence property of a function class will imply universal consistency. So let's look at this one. So suppose we have a class of functions that fulfills universal consistency. In that case, we have like the defining property, fine. And this means that ERM is universally consistent with respect to function class F. So to see that, we now need to look for the distance between the risk of our function to the base classifier. Okay, so this distance we want to bound, yeah, so it's always greater or equal to zero, but we want to bound it with some other expression, which ideally contains the expression that we have up here. Okay, so we transform the given one that we want with some inequalities into the one that we have. Okay, and now how are the steps working in between? First of all, of course, the, the, the best function has, of course, a smaller risk than any other function from f, right? So the f sub n is also from f, but the f sub f is the best one, so we can omit the absolute values here. Next, let's introduce some zeros, right? So we can subtract the empirical risk and we can add it, and we can subtract the empirical risk for this function f sub f, and we can add it, okay? So nothing changes in the next step. And next, we have an inequality where we omitted now the middle term here. Okay, so let's think about that one. So the, um, if we want to omit it, it means that this term is um, smaller than zero. Yeah, So it's a negative term. And if I omit a negative term, then the whole expression gets larger. That's why we're having greater or equal. So I need to argue that this one is a negative number. So why is it a negative number? Because f sub n is exactly, by definition, the best function f that minimizes the empirical risk. So the f sub n is exactly minimizing the, this expression r sub m. That's the empirical risk minimization principle. So this one must be smaller or equal to the empirical risk of any other functions. Okay, that's why we can omit that expression. Okay, so far so good. Then we end up with the risk of fn minus its empirical risk and the risk of f sub f and its empirical risk. And both are coming from the function class f. Okay, so both will be covered if I replace them with the supremum, so the largest possible distance among all possible functions from f. Yeah, so each supremum, so I have two supremums, and each of them is covering one of the cases. Okay, so that's why I'm getting this inequality here. So far, so good. I think the all information that you need is also written down here on the slide. So we've seen that this probability, the one that we want to bound, is greater or equal than zero, 
and then it's less than or equal to the probability where we now replace it following from this inequality. And this goes to zero because of our uniform convergence. And so we've shown that if we have uniform conversion, this implies that ERM is universally consistent with respect to F. Okay? However, there's a much stronger result that, can, that shows that it's a necessary and sufficient condition. So it's really an if and only if, where I don't show the other direction now. Okay? And it's a result from 1971, so it's already quite old. So people are thinking about this question already for a long time. Um, we've shown only sufficiency, yeah, and necessarily, necessary, ne necessity, I think, is called. Necessity, we haven't shown yet. For that one, you have to look at the book, okay? Um, curiously now, just by thinking about this function class, so suppose it gets larger, then also the supremum gets larger, right? Because it's a supremum over a larger set. So basically it means if I increase my function class, it gets more and more difficult to fulfill the uniform conversions, which intuitively makes sense, right? Maybe it's for a linear function the easiest fulfilled, and then I can add more and more functions to it, and maybe it's still fulfillable, but at some point I have too many functions in here, and I don't have uniform conversions anymore. In particular, if I take all functions, then it's not true anymore. So far, so good. Couple of questions that remain open. Now, for what function classes can we prove uniform convergence, right? Because if we can prove it, then we know, okay, we can apply the ERM induction principle and we will have a good algorithm, okay? Um, and the other question is, of course, what happens for finitely many data points? Can we say something, how fast this is going to zero for, any, for, for finitely many data points? So we want to have something like e to the minus n. So we want to have something like this Cherno Fifting bound, okay? or we want to use it somehow. So let's try to derive a bound for that one, okay? So that's the next goal now. So, and we are using two tools, a so-called union bound and then symmetrization by ghost sample. And this sounds super fancy, and it is indeed super fancy, but you will see every step is simple, yeah? And every step is understandable. I hope you are still following until, until this point. So, union bound. So for that one, let's start super simple. Let's look at a finite function class. And a finite function class, this is like, ah, okay. Finite function class, that's super trivial, right? Then the union bound should hold. That's kind of obvious. So let's see why that's the case. So the channel fifting bound gives us for every fixed f sub i this expression, right? So for every f sub i, we have such a bound, but only for a fixed f sub i, right? Not for all at the same time. Um, how can we prove now the uniform law of large numbers for a finite set of functions? Okay, we want to bound the probability for a supremum of function. If the supremum is greater than epsilon, it means that each of these finitely many things is greater than epsilon. At least one of them is greater than epsilon, okay? So that's why there's an or in between. So if one of them is greater than epsilon, then the supremum is greater than epsilon, right? Because the supremum will take the worst one, okay? So that's why I'm getting an or. And now, if they all, if, if one of them is greater, then I can bound it by saying all of them are greater. So I bound it by summing over all probabilities, all individual probabilities. So that is a very coarse jump here. Yeah? I'm, I'm from the expression where I'm saying P of A or B or C, I bound it with the summation of P of A plus P of B plus C or P of C. Okay, so that is a very, very coarse jump here. However, the nice thing is now, for each of them, I'm having the Chernoff bound. So I can plug it in, and I'm getting an M, since I'm having a finite set of M functions. Okay, so far so good. So far so trivial, and you say, ah, okay, yeah, that is obvious, right? If you only have finitely, then this is simple. But hey, this is our first bound. This is a union bound. It's a union of function of finitely many functions. Now the curious thing is, how do we get something finite, right, from the stuff that we are talking about? And that will be the next one, the symmetrization by a ghost sample, which sounds fancy, and it is a really nice idea. So let's look at that one. So we will see that we can bound the error between the true risk, or not the error, so the difference distance between the true risk and the empirical risk, we can bound it by the distance between two empirical risks. So that is kind of interesting. And here's the idea. So my empirical risk 
is coming from a sample, okay, from x1 to xn. That is what I'm using. Now suppose I'm having a second data set. Let's call it x1 prime to xn prime. That is my ghost sample, okay? And so now the first empirical risk is calculated on my sample, and the second empirical risk is calculated on the ghost sample, okay? So basically it says now um, I can bound the true risk, which is an integral over p and so on and so forth, compared with my empirical risk, I can bound it by the distance between the risk of two data sets. And that's very similar to Cauchy, Cauchy sequences. I don't know, do you know Cauchy sequences in mathematics? So um, there's a nice statement that you can write down. Um, when you define the limit of a sequence, so suppose you have A1 and so on, A2, blah, blah, blah. And then you would say um, the limit of A sub K is equal to A for K against infinity if and only if for all N, uh, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists an N zero such that for all N greater or equal to N zero, the distance between A N and A is smaller than epsilon. Quite a complicated statement when you start studying being a student because of all these quantifiers, right? So that's kind of weird in your head. However, it's only slightly more complicated than deseparation. So if you understand deseparation, you should be able to understand that one too. So that is a way to define it. However, there's another one where I'm, I'm not sure if I'm telling it right. I'm only dropping part of it. But it will be also that the distance between the um, later examples is smaller than epsilon. So that's the Cauchy sequence idea thing. So this is saying the whole sequence is getting very close to my limit value and convergence can be also defined in such a way that later examples should get as close as possible. Yeah, they should get arbitrarily close. Now the idea is very similar. So this is, is my empirical risk of one sample, and it's getting arbitrarily close to this integral that I cannot calculate to the true risk. And that's the same as if I'm having one sample and it's getting arbitrarily close to another sample. Okay? So it's very much related to this Cauchy sequence idea. Okay, now what's nice is we removed the R of F. Okay, and that's great, because on this side, there's no integral over the probability distribution P anymore. So that one is gone, okay? So that's nice. And um, of course now, here we need double amount of data. So if the empirical risk here has n data points, now I need two n data points in a way. So two n random variables, right? But it's only finitely many of those, okay? Which is good. Now the question is, how large is this function class here? Yeah? And since I'm only looking at finitely many locations and they are fixed, I can fix them. x1 to x2n, I can say there are only two to the 2n functions that I need to consider. Those are all possibilities to classify 2n data points. Okay? So actually I'm having a supremum over a large class of neural networks or blah, blah, blah. If I'm only considering 200 data points, I have only two to the 200 different functions to consider because it's only about plus one, minus one on these elements. And then there are only two to the two n examples. So many functions will tell me the same about my data. And then that is basically then the idea that this can be now bounded with a union bound because I only have a finite class of functions. Okay? So that is the main idea. So. Let's count the number of functions for a finite data sample. So here's my finite data sample, x1 to xn. Let's give a name to the number of different functions that are possible. So let's count the number of functions in my function class that differ on x1 to xn. So basically, um, zn is, are these locations, and, f, uh, and this f sub f zn is the number of functions, or is the, are all the functions which do differ on x1 to xn and then the bars make it the cardinality, so I'm counting. So why is it interesting? 
So let's say um, I'm in 2D. So suppose I'm in this space here, x1, x2. OK, so that is the input space. And I, I now can play some data points like this. And let's say I'm looking at linear classifiers. OK, so my f class of function here are all linear classifiers. Then um, how many possibilities do I have to give them labels? I think I can put a straight line here. I can put it here. I can put it here. I can put it there. I can put it there. So basically all possibilities. It should be 2 to the 6. Um, curiously, if I add another data point, then not everything is possible anymore. Yeah? So now if I would take a linear classifier, in principle I would have 2 to the 4 possibilities. But my function class of linear classifiers has fewer. Okay? And if you go in higher dimension, if I increase the number of data points, then on these data points, basically, the possibilities that I have to put them into two classes is not as large as 2 to the n. It's much smaller. Okay? So the number of functions that are possible in my restricted class is much smaller than the number of possibilities that we have here. And as, as you see, this 2 to the n is something that grows exponentially fast. And it will be this constant in front of the e to the minus n. However, if I restrict my class of functions, I'm getting something smaller. OK? And for that, we count, let's say I'm taking the linear classifiers in r to the 2. Yeah? And then we can count the number of functions on two data points, on three data points, on four data points, on five data points. And those gives us these numbers. Now, the shattering coefficient of a function class is the maximum possible of that one for any z. So if I take n data points, yeah, uh, no, yeah, if I take n data points, then basically I'm asking what is the maximum number of possibilities my function class can shatter the data points into two classes, OK? So suppose um, I'm in 2D, I'm looking at the linear functions, yeah? then my um, shattering coefficient uh, can be calculated. So for, for this situation, I can calculate this n of f and 1. If I have one data point, there will be two functions. Okay. If I have two data points, there will be also two, uh, there will be four functions, right? I could have it separated like that or like that. Oh, you can't see it. Thank you. OK, so there are four possibilities. If I have three, I think I will have also all possibilities, so it will be eight. However, now, it will get smaller. So if I have four, then I think I don't have all possibilities anymore. There are some of them are missing. Yeah. So now we would have to draw it. So it's uh, it should be six. It's not. So it's smaller than sixteen. So let's say like this, in the interest of time. So it's smaller. Okay. And then the more and more data point I have in R to the two, like this number doesn't grow as fast as exponentially. OK, so I'm restricted. So there are some explanations where I, I think I said, I said most of it. OK, fine. So the shattering coefficient is a capacity measure for function classes. right? We can also get rid of the n. Let me just show you. Uh, where is it? Oh, let me next show, show this one. So the shattering, oh no, let's, let's first show the other stuff. OK, since we are almost, oh, we are out of time. OK. So now, what can we do with this shattering coefficient now? So let's combine everything. So we are interested in, the, in this bound, this probability here, which is the distance between the true risk and the empirical risk. We've seen by the symmetrization by a ghost yeah, that we can bound it with, some, with two empirical samples, so with two empirical expressions. 
fine. Um, then our supremum here, which is going over all functions, can be restricted to the one on a much smaller set of points. Okay, only two n many data points are really read out here, right? I'm not taking all of them, and so I can use the union bound, where the union bound now uses basically this shattering coefficient because it's the number of functions that are possible. Yeah, and the number of the shattering coefficient is exactly the number of functions that are possible on two n data points for my function class. Okay, and this thing here is the m from the union bound from before. Okay, and now we can say when this expression converges to zero, then our empirical risk minimization induction principle is uniformly consistent, okay, which is a super powerful result. So here are examples. If this shattering coefficient is less than 2n to the k, for example, uh, if we can show that one, that would imply convergence since the exp e to the minus n is going down faster than 2n to the k is growing. Um, so in general, if it only grows polynomial, then the ERM principle is consistent with respect to that class of functions. However, if I'm taking all functions, yeah, then I'm having two to the two n possibilities, and in that case, we cannot get convergence, and it doesn't work. Okay. So here's our generalization bound. So that is the one that we derived, and by setting this equal to delta and solving for epsilon and plugging it in, you can also get a different form of that one, which sometimes gives you some intuition. Um, by the way, this is also like a, a regularization term in a way, right? So you want to regularize your function class, which means prefer simpler functions, because that will decrease the shattering coefficient in a way. So if you enforce like some simpler classes because of weight decay or some other things. In principle, one can then show that the second term here also goes down. And if the second term goes down, it means that the empirical risk is a good estimate for the true risk. I'm almost done. Finally, the VC dimension. And that was always a question in the exam, so you might be interested. But we reshuffled the lectures, so the VC dimension Maybe I'm asking a question about it, but um, you don't have to do a calculation with it. So the shattering coefficient is one way. So there are other ways. So there's another way is to say um, the VC dimension of a function class is a single number, and it's a maximum number of points such that the points can be completely shattered. So basically, let's look at our example. So the mass might look a bit cumbersome. So for the example on the board, the VC dimension of this linear classifier is 3. Why? Because every configuration, every labeling that I give these data points can be, lab can be classified with a linear function. So linear functions can have every of these 2 to the 3 possibilities can be classified, right? So there's the, um, let's draw it a bit over here. So what are the possibilities? There should be eight. So it could be cross, cross, cross. It could be circle, 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 cross, circle, circle, cross, cross, circle. Then there's cross, cross, circle. And now which one am I missing? Oh, there could be circle, cross, cross. And then there could be another one is, I have that one, that one, that one. I have that one, that one. There's one missing for the. Oh, OK, thank you. And which is the last one that is missing? I didn't do it very systematically. Ah, thank you very much. OK, so, and now for these ones, I can now also draw basically linear separation lines in here. So they are all shatterable. So from this picture, is implied that the VC dimension of my function class f is at least 3. Question? Ah, I can freely choose the points. So you can put the points however you want. So if you find an arrangement of three points that can be completely shattered, then we would say the VC dimension is at least 3. Now to show that the VC dimension is exactly 3, 
I need to show that any configuration of points, for all possible configuration of points, yeah, they cannot be shattered by linear classifiers, okay, which is much harder to show. Typically, you assume they are in general position, and that's like the right point, and then you would say, okay, they have some distance here, and let's say the opposite ones, they get the, this one, and the other one gets the plus label, and this cannot be classified, okay? And in principle, they could be all in on a line, of course, but that's even, even more trivial to show that this is not possible. So if they are collinear or something, it's even easier, yeah? But if they're in general position, that sometimes it works like this. So now a typical exam question in the previous years was, I give you some class of classifiers, for example, in 2D squared boxes of arbitrary radius, okay, so they can be arbitrary large, and they could be also inside out, and that is basically a separating line for a classifier, and now you should calculate the VC dimension by giving examples like this, and proving ideally that it's less than all. But this exam won't happen, so we won't do this. Anyway, so that is the VC dimension. And now anyone has an idea why it's called VC dimension? So the V is for Wapnik, and the C is for Shervonenkis. So it's the wapnik shervonenkis dimension, okay? So, and there's another big theorem, the ERM, so the empirical risk minimization, is consistent with respect to a function class f if and only if it has finite VC dimension. And this is like a very deep result, yeah? But I think you got somehow the flavor of the whole thing, okay? So I omit the example now since we are over time and we are at the end. So in statistical learning theory, you are always worried finding such formulas where the formulas then tell you something, possibly also how to find an algorithm by looking at these terms. And now there's super sophisticated stuff, Rademacher, inequalities, and whatever. So there's like big literature on how to do these things. And what I showed you today was more like the simplest possible way to get this. Okay, that's it. Thanks a lot. And that's also the end of the lecture of the probabilistic reasoning and machine learning lecture. So next time, um, we ca I can answer questions or something which you can bring. Or maybe we go over some of the material for repetition. And then that's it. Okay, so thanks a lot for being here, and see you next week. <laughs>